welcome to the ministry of God's Word presented by Thamu Naidu. Thamu is the apostolic and founding elder of Gate Ministry Santon, located in Gauteng, South Africa. Blessed with worldwide travel and teaching, his mandate is to communicate the ancient biblical blueprint for the accurate building of the Church of God. So let's get to the Word. Let's get to the Word. Are you ready? Are you enjoying the series? And, oh, that's, that's a very bad response. Are you enjoying the series on warfare? Yes. Prayer, session number 11, that's going on and on. I was saying to the Cape Town group yesterday that uh, I have chosen to move slower than snail's pace with the series because this is a hot theological potato. And uh, we have to be very careful how, we, how I present it to you. And I don't want you to get burnt eating it too fast. Um, but at the same time, I have to do a lot of deconstruction. And it's a clinical piece of work. A deconstruction of Ill, inaccurate and sometimes illegal positions adopted in terms of our understanding of prayer and warfare. And sometimes while I'm building, I'm also deconstructing. Uh, because you cannot lay new foundations into places where all foundations have not been removed. And sometimes we have to use the Jeremiah principle of uprooting, tearing down, and throwing out things before we lay foundations. All of us, in our journey, if you have been a Christian for a long time, would have collected and absorbed and imbibed patterns of behavior related to your perception of prayer and of the devil. And often, because of those perceptions, they become habits in our lives. They become practices. And uh, we, we get encumbered with, with baggage that we should not be bothered about. And so my prayer is that through the series, as I'm doing it slowly and repetitiously, that you will understand how important it is to get a very clear view of who you are, what your, your privileges are, and how and where and why you can do certain things in uh, the family of God. The more I'm doing the series, or the more I'm studying what I teach you, the more I realize how privileged we are as a people of God. We have so much of authority. In fact, apart from the sufferings and some of the challenges we have to go through in life, and that's part of God building us. He uses those situations to build us. We should be an amazingly triumphant people, amazingly blessed. The devil, the more I study the scriptures, has no power over us, absolutely no power. And if I can teach you about the methodologies of the wiles of the enemy, then you'll realize that while he has no power over you, he has to use very clever, if not wise, wisdom as in earthly wisdom to distract you from who you are, to deviate your focus, to shift your focus. And that's the only way he has authority over you. I'm not saying he's not real. I'm not saying he is not a present reality. I'm not saying that he does not rule over the air. But remark the words, he rules over the air. In other words, the passages between how we engage the eternal realm. Uh, he may be uh, the prince of the cosmos or this present age, this present aeon. He's managing the time by managing the systems. But he is not the owner of anything. Uh, and we just need to know how to distract him uh, from the way he operates. One of the things about the devil is, is that when he is described as a ruler, he is described as a prince. And a prince, the word, out of the word prince comes the word principalities. And out of the word, uh, well, a principality is somebody who rules. Uh, so prince, principality, but they rule through principles. 
through principles. So, and they install principles in the form of paradigms, ideologies, um, and, uh, you know, schools of thought, etc. And the enemy is a master at constructing a way of thinking so, so that he becomes a prince over mindsets and patterns of, uh, and ideologies that become realities in the lives of people. And if we know how to deconstruct the principles of the prince of the air, he will have no place to live in us. And uh, that's why faith is such an important thing. Faith comes to erode uh, the, the, the thinking and the teachings of the enemy. Uh, he spews a flood. Uh, in other words, he vomits delusional teachings to us. And we have to learn how to protect ourselves from these things. So what I'm telling you here today, and what I have been trying to tell you in previous weeks, is that you have to get your focus right. If you get that right, 95% of your, your battles are won. Yeah. You are what you think. Uh, your perception of life, that's your sight. And how you perceive the things you see will determine how you construe your, your life in the earth. So it's in that context I bring to you Ephesians chapter 6 again. Let's read it, Ephesians 6, because each one of us have to be clothed, well clothed, uh, in garments that are unstained or spotted, contaminated or polluted by the world uh, or by the things that the devil will throw at you. He wants to pollute us, and we must keep a pure and innocent presence before the Lord. Finally, my brethren, mark the words, finally, therefore, therefore, above all. These are very powerful words here. They are, these are imperatives, um, and they, they, they place value on, on what is being emphasized. So finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We explained that last week. Put on the whole armor. Everyone say whole. That's a complete armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wilds. Everyone say wilds. It does not say stand against the devil. It says stand against the wilds of the devil. What does that mean? That means that he has methodologies, he has a scheme, he has a plan of working against us. The, the Greek word for wilds is met, method, methodia, methodia, out of which we get the word methods, methodology. Uh, met, Met, uh, methodology. Uh, in other words, the devil knows how to entrap us. He uses various schemes, various methods, various ways. So you need to study his methodologies. The devil, we don't study the devil. Say to your neighbor, we don't study the devil. We study his ways. Too many people are obsessed with studying the devil. They want to read books on how a witch once was, you know, a practitioner of the devil before she converted to the faith and so forth. And I'm not saying you can't read the testimonies, but when we get obsessed with studying the devil, you get possessed by what you, what you study. Okay, and that's how we produce some strange patterns of behavior. So there are, when we talk about uh, the, the methods of the devil, we are literally talking about his way, his path, his road, his route. He's key, you know, he's, he has a procedure, a mannerism to the, the way he does things. And you have to know that. You have to know how to, dis, to shift your focus. When I had the experience with being burnt, I could, I could have built a theology around how the devil, uh, you know, caused for me to do something so silly. But I realized that his methodology is to distract me from my focus. And I had to learn how not to be distracted, but, but focus. Focus on how I can learn from, you know, in being a better person through the experiences I've had. And each one of you here, each one of us here, are faced with many distractions. And you need to learn how to stay focused. That's what it means. It's a very complex word, this, and um, it's steeped in, in classical Greek, the word me me methodia. Uh, but I don't want to get caught up with that. All I want to say is that, that you may be able to stand against the wilds. 
the methods of the devil, not against the devil. The devil has been defeated already on the cross of Calvary. He's been stripped of his powers. Uh, he goes about like a roaring lion, but he's, he can't bite anymore. He, it's a comparison, like a roaring lion. He goes about like a roaring lion. That's what it says. Uh, and uh, sometimes the roar is what intimidates, what freezes us, what causes us to fear. Um, that you may be able to stand. Everyone say stand. And this is the word is temai. Okay, histamines, histamic, the medical terms, antihistamines comes from this word stand. It means if you know how to stand, you will create a shield around yourself that will stop any attack against you. Like an histamine is there to protect your body from an allergy or something of that sort. Okay, so it comes to arrest a breach in your human body. When we learn how to stand in, a, in, a, in, a, in the way God wants us to, we create a shield around us. We create a presence around us. There is a protection that comes. You know, if you can only in the spirit see how, how well protected you are when you stand in the Lord. Remember what I told you last week. We don't stand in anything, but we are strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, not in our own strength, not in how many hours you've fasted and prayed. Yes, fasting is very important. Prayer is very important. Uh, but you stand in the Lord. You, your state, your condition, you, your whole stature is in the Lord. And this is very important, um, that, you may be, be, that, you may, that you may be able to stand against the wilds of the devil, for we do not wrestle. Everyone say we. The word we here is the word ego. I'm going to talk about that more. This is a very controversial word. Ego is a self-centered, conceited. It's, it's, ego is a personal pronoun. It highlights the individuality of a person. The correct statement here is for I. Paul is the writer. He's writing to the, Corinthian, uh, to the Ephesians, and he says to them, for I, I. He says, you stand... For I do not wrestle against flesh and blood, not we, but in the I is the we. What does that mean? The one who is over a group of people represents the we. In one Adam were many Adams. In Christ, who hung on the cross, was all the other Christ. So when he says I, he's saying I will be doing the fight on behalf of you, you stand, I wrestle. That's what he says here, which I want to talk about if time permits today. All right. So this is a very controversial thing. What we do is we tell everybody to wrestle. And that's why some people become defeated because it's not in their ranking to wrestle and uh, to bind principalities and powers. You have to know on which level you engage. We, I told you about how... Uh, Daniel was in prayer for 21 days, fasting and prayer. He didn't choose a fast. He was waiting for God, and it ended up in a 21-day fast. And as Daniel was waiting on the Lord, and it took him 21 days to get an answer, when the angel eventually arrived, the angel said, I was on my way to you on the first day, on the first day of your, of your request from God, but it took 21 days for me to arrive here because we were confronted by the prince of, per uh, of Persia. And the prince of Persia contended with us to a place where we could not overcome him. And we needed assistance. And that's when God sent Michael to help with the warfare. What is the point I'm making? Even angels can't overcome certain things despite the fact that they came from God. They came from God, and they had to wait for recruitments, for support. They needed others to come to strengthen them. Similarly with us, you have to understand that while we are all are equal in God, we are all the sons of God, we all are co-heirs with Christ, joint heirs with Christ, while we are all connected to the same family, we all have the Holy Spirit, but when it comes to warfare, there's ranking. 
And Paul is saying here, yeah, for I do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's what he says. Therefore, therefore, so while he's shifting from them to him, now he comes back and he says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. Everyone say withstand, which is the equivalent of standing. This is the word anti-stemi, uh, um, which means resist. This is like how you take, uh, you know, um, medication to resist the flu or to resist an allergy and so forth. Therefore, he says, while you take up the whole armor, let me do the battling. And this is, there's a warfare that apostles do that normal people in the body of Christ do not do. You know, and, and we understand this. There's protocol to everything. There are certain things the president of our country can do that every one of us in the country can't do. And that does not mean the president is more important than us. It's simply, I mean, you know that we're in a de de democracy and every person is equal according to the constitution of the country. But that does not mean that because you're equal, you can do anything and everything. There's a ranking. Uh, there is order. There's structure and so forth. People need to understand this. I mean, you can go to the army. You can go to the army and join. You can enlist in the army. You could, have, you could be a professor in a university and have a general that doesn't have a couple of degrees like you. But when you go to the army, no matter how powerful you are, you will have to submit to a certain order. There's ranking there. I mean, in, in the British army, or in the, what was, uh, Harry. Harry was in, was it the Air Force? In the Air Force. Uh, he was, I mean, he's a prince. He comes from the royal family. But when he went to the army, he was no different to any soldier. In fact, he had to start right at the lowest rungs of the army. And he had to submit to, to people above him. And there was an order and a structure. Similarly, when the imagery is given to us that we are the army of God, we have to understand on what levels we can engage. There's a lot of people, I, I, this crazy stuff. I, I, I humbly say crazy stuff. The stuff is crazy stuff, getting a few people together, whether it's women or men or a mixed group, and saying, let's bind some principality. That's why we've caused such, such harm and danger. And, and some people have been damaged in their minds and, and in the emotions and families have been attacked. Marriages have become dysfunctional because when people do not know how ranking takes place, our order takes place in, in the army of God. Uh, obviously, exposure comes uh, to us. And if you understand this, you'll also understand how when angels were contending for the body of Moses on the mount, uh, and, and uh, obviously the angels of God with the angels of with the, the fallen angels and the devil himself. Uh, the angels will not even want to bring an accusation against those who were trying to take the body of Moses. And, and, and they would not say, they would not speak authoritatively. And eventually when they did speak, they quoted the Lord and not themselves. They said, the Lord rebuked you, not us. But in the church today, we got this, this lawless, uh, almost foolish way of practicing warfare where we think we can just do what we want, when we want, and, and, uh, and devils don't understand, you know, devils will just listen to us. I'm not saying that you can't cast out de demons, but when you're talking about principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, then you have to understand it takes an ambassadorial anointing an apostolic grace, uh, a truly a head of a family or a head of a whole group of people that can exercise that level of spiritual engagement. And those are some of the things that we need to start to understand when we talk about shields today. Uh, so he uh, says, yet yeah, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. And this is where every one of you have to come in. And I will read First Thessalonians chapter 3 again for us here today. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Not wrestle, not fight, 
Stand. I mean, see how many times the word stand is used here. More than th four times. Stand, withstand, stand. Uh, stand, therefore. Verse 14. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. That's your spirit with truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. That's your soul covered with divine templates and designs of how you should exist. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's your physical existence. Your feet represents your physical presence on the earth. So your spirit, soul, and your physicality, your physical being must be covered. And your feet shod with peace. That's why wherever you go, peace, shalom, must become a reality. Are you understanding? We're not people of war, of debates, of arguments, or of sarcasm, or of behaving badly. Wherever we go, we bring peace. And only when people reject us, then we dust our feet. And we say, okay, we brought peace to your house, but if you don't want peace, then we remove our, our presence. And that's when chaos comes and confusion comes into those realms. Are you with me? And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, look at verse 16, above all. And this word, above all, is a very powerful word. It, it, it highlights, it highlights um, what God wants to emphasize. Above all, well, you must get everything else in, in, in order. The first order is that, um, that you must be stand in the Lord and any strength. You must understand that while you standing, there are those individuals over you that will be fighting for you. Okay, fighting for you. There's an immunity. I'm telling you, I'm seeing an immunity that will come over whole groups of people when they know how to stand in the Lord. And how God will use certain individuals to bring preservation and protection over, the, uh, over groups of people. Look at what it says here now. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Everyone say shield of faith. With which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation, put it on your head, C protect your mind with understanding how you were saved. Take it, put it on your head, and the sword of the Spirit, that's the word, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. This is uh, praying in the Spirit. This is not praying in tongues. Praying in tongues is one aspect of praying in the Spirit. This is praying being governed and led by the Holy Spirit, praying in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me, that's Paul, that utterances may be given to me, that I may, be, uh, my, uh, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel and to announce to the, to the various parts of the world that I would be given the authority to what the good news is, to bring peace, to bring good news to different realms in the earth. And so Paul is highlighting this for which, and he uses a very powerful word here, I am an ambassador, okay, a, a very senior elder, a presbyteros, a legal person that will act on behalf of the Lord in the regions that I am. And the word ambassador is a powerful one here. Uh, in chains that in it I might speak boldly as I ought to speak. And you go, go on and read. So here's the points that I, that I want to highlight here today. And it's very, very important. For, this, for a house to enjoy spiritual immunity, you have to make sure that you're well clothed from head to toe in your spirit, your soul, and your physical being in the Lord. You have to put on the clothes. I told you last week that David could not go to war in Saul's armor because it was not tested and proven. You must develop from in every part of your being, you must develop how you exist. And whatever you do, you must know it works for you because you've tested it. I'm not talking about an ideological or theoretical 
covering, you must develop a helmet, a breastplate. You must know how to keep a belt on your, on your, on your spirit, on your loins. Um, you need to know how to have your feet shod with the preparation of peace. You must have at all times a shield of faith and the sword of the spirit. Every one of us must be well clothed. If there are breaches in your military apparel, if you do not know how to be combatant in being clothed right, then I can tell you the enemy has a right to attack us. You must understand that. There are things that are very difficult for me to say here, very difficult because of the controversies it could cause, but in you being prepared, that's when God will raise up apostolic grace over households and huge territories in a given region to bring about protection on another level. I'll talk a little bit about that today. But standing is important, and this is one of the things I want to highlight. It's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. I know I've repeated this last week or mentioned it last week, but I want to, I want to highlight something for, for us here. There's something insinuated in the statements of the Apostle Paul. And this is what he's going to say, and I'll explain it in the weeks ahead. Paul is saying that the strength of cosmic, uh, the strength of apostolic warfare in, uh, at, at cosmic levels, warfare that will take place at higher levels than just the domestic challenges that we would have. Paul is saying that the strength of warfare that takes place at the highest levels will be subject to how strong local houses are. In other words, if a local house and people in that house are continuously plagued, not covered properly, not positioned right, then the strength of apostolic thrust, leverage, will, will weaken. It will hemorrhage. We will, it will leak power. That's what Paul is saying. In other words, what Paul is saying is, if our houses know how to stand in the Lord, being clothed from head to toe, in the armor that God wants for those houses, then we would be able to see warfare take place on a level that we've never encountered before. Warfare will take place. We will see great breakthroughs take place in the earth. And most of us know that we need to cleanse environments of demonic activity. There's principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness ruling over our land. South Africa is, no, uh, is a good example of that. Uh, there's so much of wickedness in our land, so much of evil, that we cannot just be a community that enjoys uh, immunity from the attacks of the enemy without cleansing our land of demonic activity. Okay, and demons are ruling, principalities are ruling from, from, from as high up as the government of our country and many other countries in the world and in every echelon of governance. And, and some of you that are in key positions will tell you of all the demonic activity that's taking place in our country at, at various levels. And how are we going to remove them? By you learning how to be strong in the Lord. By you learning how to be clothed from head to toe. This is very, very important. Now let me read the scripture for you. It's... Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, Therefore, brethren, therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. By your faith. For now we live, for, for now we live, if you stand fast in the Lord. Say to your neighbor, if you stand fast. In other words, he's saying our existence our effic efficacy, our ability to exercise the things that God has called us to do is subject to how strong the houses under the jurisdiction of apostles are. Okay, I can speak for you, and I can speak to live streaming today to many houses that are under my oversight in the earth. The strength of our reach in the nations 
and the strength of the energy and ability locked up within those that have been called to give oversight to global communities is subject to how strong local houses are. That's what he's saying here. This is a causative principle for now we live if you, if you stand fast in the Lord. We cannot have a bunch of people tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, unstable, unrooted, not grounded, not steadfast, not faithful, not obedient. They don't understand their salvation. They still have personality crises. They don't know who they are. The one day they're a son of God, the next day they're defeated, whatever. You can't be like this. You have to know how to stand fast. In fact, uh, the, the portion of Scripture says in, in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, it says, watch Stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. The strength of a local house determines how much of work we do in the earth. There are days when I know for a fact that my energy is completely weakened and depleted, not because of my frenetic, frenetic uh, travels, not because of that. And it's not because of my physical activity. It's because in the spirit, I'm completely drained. And I know that that draining is caused by people not learning how to stand in the Lord. I don't know why it is like that, but when we do read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in the weeks ahead of us, you will find that Paul says, I cannot go beyond you. He's writing to the Corinthians. And he says, only if you absorb and fulfill everything I've taught you, God will shift the horizons or redefine the boundaries for my engagement. So it's of critical importance in this church. We all learn how to stand in the Lord. And let me, let me speak in, in, in very narrow language here. Very narrow language. You standing fast is not just simply for the benefit of those who are, have been given apostolic oversight over you. You standing fast will benefit you in your personal breakthroughs also. So don't think you're doing it for somebody else, but you're also doing it for yourself. Your strength will also bring victories for you, but it will give us greater leverage from an apostolic point of view to cleanse environments, to shift environments so that demons don't make our, our areas of existence a, a playground. Uh, and demons are wreaking havoc in the land today. But when a strong church arises under apostolic authority, and we all are strong in the Lord, let me tell you something. The devil can't touch you. Can't touch that region. In fact, they will have to beg for permission to come into an area. Remember what happened when Jesus came and cleansed the man that had a thousand demons in him? Hmm? Yeah. From, um, uh, what's that region in Galilee? Uh, uh, yeah. And um, what did the demons say when he cast them out? They said, we know we cannot live in this territory. So how do we now continue to exist because our time has not come? And, um, and, and Jesus, and then they said, would you allow us to go into the pigs? And Jesus said, okay, go into the pigs. And they had no place in the land to dwell the pigs were driven by those demons into the ocean, and they drowned. That's the point I'm making. When we start to move to a higher level of warfare, understanding the ministry of apostles and their true function in the earth, you'll be surprised to see how whole environments will be cleansed of demonic activity. Demons will beg to go to the pigs. You like that? You like that? So say to your neighbor, we have to be strong. For now, for now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you, for all the joy with which we rejoice for, for your sake before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. That's why Paul would say him um, that, if you get stronger, we get stronger. And then he says, and yet we long then to come to you to add to your strength 
because we know in that way we will be strong. And uh, this is critical. I mean, you know this, that the strength of economies in countries are determined by the strength of families. The microcosm to an economy is the strength of people. If people are unemployed, the economy suffers. If people are empowered, the economy prospers. Similarly with the things of God. If we, as at households, are strong, let me tell you something, the economy of God will proliferate in the earth. So please, please, I'm, I'm trying to simplify this as much as I can. It's so important for us to learn how to put on the whole armor of God. Romans chapter 13 verse 11 says, And do this knowing, that the, the, knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. Okay, it's high time. Everyone say high time. <laughs> wake up. Okay, wake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Therefore the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and, in, and envy, but put on. Everyone say put on. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. First uh, Peter 5, 5, 5 says this, Likewise, you younger people, you those that are less mature, submit yourselves to your elders, your fathers, the fathers of churches. Yes, and all you be submissive to one another and be clothed, clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of the Lord that he, might, that he may exalt you in due season. In due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood, in the world, and may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And I can read to you so many scriptures, so many, but it's all subject to how we would submit. There's no magical formula. You can accept Jesus Christ, but if you don't put on Christ, if you don't clothe yourself in the light, if you don't clothe yourself in the spirit of humility and become submitted to the way God wants us to work, there's no immunity for us the way we think it should be. Amen? Are you understanding me? Um, so it's very important because our fight is against principalities and powers and rulers and, uh, of the darkness of this age spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. So it's important to understand this. So last week I spoke to you about the shield of faith. And every one of you needs to have a shield of faith. You know, sometimes we quote the scripture, the Lord is my buckler. The buckler was a small shield. And every one of you have to have a small shield. Okay, I'm, there's other shields I'll talk about just now. Every one of us need a shield. And sometimes the enemy will throw something at you, accusation, some, you know, some temptation. He will lure things, he will dangle things before you. He would bring a crisis, or whatever he does. You must have your shield. You must know how to absorb whatever he says because of your faith. Your faith. All of us need to hide behind the shield. And, uh, and the shield of faith is knowing your religion. It's not quoting a few scriptures from the promise box. 
That's not shield of faith. That's positive confession. That's Oprah Winfrey thinking. Okay? Positive confessions. That's modern day, new age ideologies. When we talk about shield of faith, it's knowing what you believe. It's reckoning what you believe. It's standing behind a whole house of, of understanding your faith. Protocols, regulations, uh, understanding the constitution of the heavens, understanding the statutes and the commands of God. It's knowing, understanding your faith. In the church today, the spiritual IQ of the average believer is very low. Very low. Most believers just only know that they accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. They don't know the Bible. I'm not asking you to quote the scriptures. I'm asking you to live in the scriptures. They don't know the way of the Lord. They don't know the, how he operates. They don't understand the protocols, the procedures, the, you know, the regulations, and so forth. The church is, is functioning on, on what you call ignorance. Paul understood it even in the day of, that he lived. He said, you know, how I would exchange my position for these Jews that are so ignorant. He said, I sometimes want to trade my position and go to hell so they can go to heaven. He says, they are filled with a zeal for God, but they lack the knowledge of God. And zealousness is not equal to the acquisition of knowledge, the accumulation of knowledge. And I'm not talking about knowledge in an esoteric way, where, oh, you can just quote the scriptures. I've known a lot of people that can talk big, but they can't live what they talk. The first test comes, they shrivel. You'll see carnality, immaturity, silly behavior, bad language, all these things prop up. Why? Because they, they don't have the faith. The faith is a subjective thing. And you, we have to absorb the way we know our faith. So we all have to live behind a shield. But the, and, and that's having your little shield, your buckler. But there is another shield. And Sam Solon made reference to it. It's a shield that comes, uh, uh, the word shield is the word turios, and it means the stone that, is, uh, that, that pro prohibits entry into the grave. Into the grave. Remember the stone that was placed in front of the grave of Jesus and sealed by Roman soldiers? so that his dead body would not be taken out, stolen at night. That stone is also called shield, Torios. And we all know that we've been buried with Christ. We've all been buried with Christ. We're all in the tomb, in the sense that when he died, we died. Okay? And that stone seals your death. It seals it. It pronounces your death. And that stone is a picture of how God has, has brought us to a place where we've died to the life lived in the flesh. That's a stone. And it's your shield. It tells you that you no more react and respond like a human being does. Your response and reactions are in the spirit. Obviously, angels came and rolled away that stone. Messengers came and rolled away the stone, and they brought us into a resurrected and ascended position. And similarly, all of us have to know that your faith includes your death to self, your death to flesh, your death to your own personal opinions and attitudes and so forth. And some of us have to deal with the issues of our soul in those areas. You'll be surprised to discover how in the soul we've been entrapped and attacked. How in the soul the enemy has robbed us of what we need. Some of us are living in the historical and distant part, uh, past of our upbringing. And that, that cave where the stone, stone is, that shield is, is trying to tell you, come on guys, you've died to that. Now if, the, if you want to live, you have to live your life in Christ. No more in your flesh. No more in your past. And we have to grow up to that. So there's a stone 
that God puts and that becomes a shield to us. So when the enemy attacks me and tells me of, about my past, I tell him, no, 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 I'm dead. I died to that. And now my life is lived in Christ. I'm no more living in that distant past. And it doesn't have to be a sinful past. It could be a negative experience in your upbringing. It could be some encounter with your father or your mother. It could be something, as Dr. Sam would say, that may have taken place in the, in the womb, and somehow your subconscious has registered it. Because remember, uh, at conception, life is being formed. And that's why God hates abortion, because of that conception that takes place right in the womb. And sometimes, you know, feelings are formed there, and sometimes we allow that to resurrect in our lives in the future. And, and they become an enemy to us. In so many ways, they attack us and they tell us, you know, of, about your rejection and your lovelessness and, and somebody doesn't care for you. And so often, those things absorb us in the future. In the future. And my prayer is today that the, you would hide behind the stone and remind yourself that it's no more you that lives, but Christ that lives in you. You understand? This, the words for shield of faith, it does not only speak of a small buckler, uh, a small shield, or a, a stone that is in front of your, your tomb, okay? But it also speaks about a door, a door. In the early days, and you would probably see this in, 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 in movies, uh, especially, you know, classical movies that go back to the days of the Roman Empire and the Greek kingdom and so forth, you will find that shields were the picture of a door. In fact, a shield was as high as a man, and it covered him from his head right to his toe. And they called it a door. They called the shield a door. So you would not be able to see a person. You'll see the shield. And they would uh, use those to protect themselves from the fiery darts or the attacks of the enemy. I want to say, and, and a door is a very, a very powerful symbolism. The door it speaks about a man. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Uh, if you want to come into somebody's house, you have to knock on the door, and the man of the house, the head of the house, has to, to receive you. That's what the Bible tells us. Uh, doors are very, very powerful in Scripture, and they speak about people who had families. In, in the case of the New Testament church, elders over households or apostles over whole groups of people. Apostles over whole groups of people. So doors are learning how to hide also. Uh, and doors are a form of security. They speak about gates. They speak about gates, portals of entry. And I want to say to us that your shield of faith must be multi-layered. I'd like to go into all the scriptures, but time will not permit me. Multi-layered. You must have your little shield. You must know your faith that you've, been di you've died to yourself and you're hiding behind the stone that keeps your body from the world out there, unless the angel removes it. But thirdly, you have to learn how to hide behind those who lead you. Those that lead you. Now, please, I don't believe that you worship people. I don't believe that you idolize people like myself that lead this house. I would not allow anyone to idolize me wherever I travel. Uh, I, I find it difficult to even give my bag to be carried by somebody. Uh, that's simply because this is not something that happens in the flesh. But I also understand at the same time that God places people over you to protect you. I understand that. Uh, doors in the scripture, if you read the city of God, of walls and gates, of walls are apostles. Doors are the patriarchs over the 12 tribes. These are fathers over whole groups of people. And uh, when the Bible says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, it's saying to the fathers, lift up your heads and let the king of glory come in. Fathers bring the, father, the Lord into a city. So if the enemy has to come in, he has to come first to burn your gates and uh, attack your walls. That's the only way you can get into the city of God. The, and we are protected. There's a shield that comes around us, and that shield is people. 
I don't know why God does this the way he does it. I would like to think that he is the shield, but I understand the corporeal principle. The corporeal principle is that God uses people to protect us. And Paul understood this. Paul in Acts 20 says these words before he, he would speak of his death. And they wept when he told them he's going to go, never to come back, and he's dying. He's going to die. They wept. And he said to them, but when I do leave you, wolves will come amongst you if you don't know how to protect yourselves. Now, how can he say that most of the time he was not with them? Paul was in prison for long periods of time. And when he wrote certain portions of scripture, he wrote it from prison, like the book of Ephesus, uh, if he, the, the epistle to the Ephesians. He wrote it from from prison. So how would Paul come and say, wolves will come amongst you? Because he's been an absent apostle. He was never present with the Ephesians for long periods of time. But his physical presence from the earth, the removal of his physical presence from the earth, would automatically open the door for wolves to come in. Let me tell you about shepherding. Let me tell you about shepherding. David was a young man who had no experience in war, but was placed over his father's sheep. For the, the lion and the bear to get the father's sheep, it was determined by how the shepherd would look after the sheep. And David had no casualties amongst his father's sheep. He said to Saul, not one of my father's sheep was lost. Because... I look after them to the point when the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear came against my father's sheep. I protected it with my life. And because I delivered the sheep from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, I will be able to deliver Israel from the hand, the paw, of the Philistine. What is the point? There is a divine immunity that comes. Now you know that a little boy can't take a lion. I stood before a bear. I mean, I'm small. But that bear made me feel smaller than I was. What's the point? Very simply, these are huge animals. These are beasts. These are the wickedness we're talking about in the world. But somehow or the other, when you understand that there are shields, there are doors that protects you, that's why the Bible tells us God stands at the door and knock. He cannot even come into our house without first showing it to the first coming to convince the father of the house about how he wants to come and sup with the family, have a meal with the family. Spiritual engagement takes place through, through doors. You know the principle of the spying out of the land. Twelve fathers of twelve tribes, the heads of each tribe, were sent to see the land. Only when they gave permission or rejected was God then, was God able to determine what to do. When the ten said, we don't want the land, then God said, then we, you stay in the wilderness until a new leadership arises that says, we can take the land. Fathers make huge decisions. The word for shield also refers to kings. Kings. And I'll go into the depths of what I'm saying later on um, in my series. A kings, when a king was righteous before the Lord, the land was immunized from attacks. Suddenly a shield would come upon the land. And when a king was unrighteous, the enemy just came in easily and plundered and took away whatever they wanted. Uh, there is a spiritual immunity that comes when the nation learns how to hide behind a shield. Say to your neighbor, we need to hide behind a shield. Amen? Um, now, the ultimate shield is the Lord. I don't have to tell you that. The Genesis 15, 1 tells, tells, the Lord tells Abraham, Abram then, do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But you know who, while God is the shield, sovereign, supreme, and without contradiction, and God will protect us. But God always uses human shields. You know who was Abraham's shield? Melchizedek. That's why he gave him bread. Uh, he gave him tithes. 
because he received bread and wine. What was he saying? My immunity is locked up in my connectivity to you. And because I knew how to connect to you because you are the source to the things I need, I could go and overcome four coalitions, a kingdom of, uh, I mean, four kingdoms uh, uh, with huge armies. And I could do it with 318 men because the Lord is my shield. Are you understanding me? And in the church today, we have to understand this. You know, the democratic world says we don't trust in men. Uh, and I'm not asking you to put your trust in men. But you have to know how to recognize the way God does things. Yes, the Lord is our shield. Um, uh, he is our glory. He is the one that keeps us, etc. But Deuteronomy 33.29 says, Happy are you, O Israel. Who, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord? The shield of your help. Okay? And the sword of your ma majesty. Your enemies shall submit to you and you shall tread down their high places. And if you understand Israel, you would see that the shield over Israel was Moses. How do I know that? Moses... Uh, Moses never went to any war, but his people had to go to fight to reclaim cities. Uh, and they, 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 they were at the River Jordan, and they would go and fight to take cities on the wilderness side. And on one particular battle, Moses lifted his hands like this. And as long as his hands were lifted, the whole nation, was, they were winning the war. And then he got tired, and his hands started to drop. The moment he started to drop, the energy of the people waned, and, the, and defeat started to come to them. And then Aaron and Eir came, and they lifted the, his hands to the point where they couldn't even hold it up long enough, so they put stones under his hands on either side, just to keep it up. And the, as long as the hands of Moses was lifted up, the nation of Israel were victorious, and eventually they won the war. I mean, Moses was a shield over Israel. I mean, I think about natural Israel today. Natural Israel, uh, they are, I mean, they are hedged in, hemmed in by violent forces, nations around them that hate the Israelites, including the Palestinian, uh, Palestinians. And you know all the wars that are leveraged against Israel. I don't want to get into the politics of that. But Israel has developed a system of protecting themselves from violent attacks. And one of the attacks that comes against Israel is in the form of missiles. Missiles. And they can't vigilantly stop the missiles from falling upon them because it's hundreds of missiles almost every week in some instances. So what does Israel do? They build a system of shields to detect the missiles that will be launched. And it is the anti-missile system that shields the nation from attacks. Some people go to bed at night and get up in the morning not knowing missiles were launched against them. But the shields come against it and protect them from the attacks of the missiles. In the spirit, in the spirit, God raises people. When Paul says, you know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities and powers. And later on he would say, I fought beasts in Ephesus. Wild forces of darkness. What is he saying? He is highlighting how God protects the people through apostolic covering. So I'm saying to all of us here today that we have to learn to develop a culture where we understand that the shield of the Lord is often the people that he places over us. Uh, if you went, I mean, and, and there's various tiers to this message. I mean, just elders, elders are a shield. The word is episcopos and presbyteros, fathers over households. We have a network, a matrix, a shield, a missile system. These guys are not just there to visit you and to counsel you and pray for you. But when they are released into true eldership, the word epi 
means to be over. Scopos means to have, a, have sight or scope over. Okay, oversight. In the spirit, they don't even know what you are doing. But in the, in the spirit, they become a fence. Go and study the word episcopos, oppress buteros. You will find that those who are placed over congregations create a shield over people, even if they are not in prayer over you every day. Even if they don't even know your names. They may not even phone you. Just their presence is a shield. In fact, the word for elder literally means an invisible barrier, like a fence around people. How does God hedge us in? How does God hem us in? How does God protect us? It is by him putting various shields over us. Uh, there are shields that are going to come over the earth. Let me read one scripture and stop. Um, let me read one. Psalm 47 verse 9. And it says this in 47.9. The princes of the people have gathered together. The people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. It's not saying the Lord is the shield here. Yeah. It says the shields of the earth belong to God. He's referring to the princes of the land. He is greatly exalted. Psalm 89 verse 18, for our shield belongs to the Lord, referring to David, and our king to the Holy One of Israel. In other words, like David knew the, how the Lord would protect him, David also knew that he was a shield over a people. That's why righteous leadership, godly leadership, sub, submitted leadership, is a critical part of our spiritual development in God. Let me tell you, in this country or any country in the world, there's no safety. And I'm not saying that we are guaranteed safety, but what I'm saying is there's a greater security when you know how to come under submission to the way God protects us from the works of the enemy. Amen? Say to your neighbor, the shields of the Lord belong, the shields of the earth belong to the Lord. Okay, the shields of the earth belong to the Lord. I will talk a little bit more about that in the days ahead. Uh, I want to crawl into this because it's a very difficult subject to communicate. Are you ready to see the protection of the Lord? Are you ready not to worship men, but to see how the Lord, through a corporeal principle, exhibits himself in the earth? And that's why we need to raise up true apostles today. Not people that just carry a title. Because those are the ones that will bring protection and preservation. As much as we, the elders here, protect households. Like David taking care of his dad's sheep. That's the way God protects us. So come, let's stand. Let's appreciate him. Aren't you happy to be protected? Aren't you happy to be? That's why being connected to a house is so important. You can't be, you can't be disconnected. Your, your preservation, your security, your immunity, your prosperity, your existence, your, your safety lies in connection, in belonging. Uh, and amongst us, no migrants. Okay, no gypsies. No aliens, all sons of God, all children of the Most High God. Okay, I've tried to keep this message as simple as possible, but lift your hands and ask God to give you an understanding. Ask Him to help you to see how He takes care of us. Shalom on Thank Him for protection. Thank Him for preservation.